Welcome everybody to a very special Symbio Beta Live. Would you believe it, my internet just crapped out in my house, so I have a nice wide connection all ready for this in my studio in my basement, and uh, down went the internet. So uh, apologies for the five minute delay, but uh, we've had a uh, fantastic time preparing for this webinar in terms of synthetic biology and the US government and what's going on, not just in the, in the, in the whole world, but specifically today focusing on, on the US. And this is a series of events where we're gonna be engaging with what's happening with governments around the world, particularly around the bioeconomy, particularly around the response to COVID and all the stimulus that's coming down the pipeline, the first of which is the US government. We're welcoming a lot of international participants, all curious to find out what's going on, and a lot of people from around the US. So as usual, if you wanna type into the box and say hi to other folks, please do so. This is a live Q&A and we will be taking questions from the audience. And if you have a question, you can type it into the Q&A box and also raise your hand and you can ask the panelists live. So we'll be going until the top of the hour with a lot of questions. So welcome, if you're just joining us, this is Symbio Beta Live and my name is John Cummers. I'm the CEO and the founder of Symbio Beta. And today we're gonna to be talking about synthetic biology and America's future, new opportunities for working with the US government. The US government, uh, there we go, now my studio lights are starting to go off. It's one of those days, uh, 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 I guess. Um, the US government is turning to bio-based solutions to solve increasingly complex problems. And right now we're laying the groundwork for how the synthetic biology community can best interact with the government to provide sustainable solutions at scale. And today I'm joined by a very distinguished panel, panelists, set of panelists, leaders in our field who are building synthetic biology industrial platforms and understanding the national security and biosecurity implications of everything that we do. Joining us today, we have the CEO and founder of Ginkgo Bioworks, Jason Kelly. Justin Sanchez, who is the Life Sciences Research Technical Fellow at Battelle and used to run DARPA's Biology Technology Office. Megan Palmer at Stanford University. She's the Executive Director for Biopolicy and Leadership Innovations in the Department of Bioengineering at Stanford. Michael Corris, who's a consultant at Battelle. And Doug Friedman, who is the Executive Director of the Engineering Biology Research Consortium. Today's topics are going to range everything from modernization of the US military and the Department of Defense's investment in that. We're going to be talking about the Endless Frontiers Act and the Bioeconomy Research and Development Bill, which recently passed the Senate. We're going to be talking about new funding opportunities that are available for companies to support commercial development. And in particular, a big pain of the industry that we know everybody's feeling is scalability. How does this industry really turn the corner on sustainability? bringing the cost low enough so that we can get all the products that people are developing out into people's hands and seeing the benefit of the bioeconomy to answer some of humanity's grandest of challenges. We're also gonna be talking about the government industry interface and harmonizing goals uh, within the community. So I wanna start with Megan Palmer. Megan has been working at the interface of government and uh, biosecurity for, for many years. Megan, I think a lot of people, when they think about the US military and its engagement with, the, with synthetic biology, they're probably worried that the, that the Department of Defense is gonna be creating bioweapons. Can you reassure us? Um, well, let's just start off by saying that we broadly are recognizing that bioweapons is, is a terrible idea, right? This Agreed. is one of the things- Do we wanna do a poll on that? No, I'm joking. We think Sorry. about biology, right? Is we've, we've decided that a whole class of weapons is, is out of bounds, right? And I think this is something that's important to say up front that um, in the midst of all of this, we're all made of biology, our living world is made of biology. And so we need to safeguard and, and shepherd this technology so that it benefits all and doesn't put others at, at, in harm's way. And let's just uh, bottom line this, it's international treaty that outlaws bioweapons specifically, right? Yes, yes. We have the Biological Weapons Convention, we're signatories, the world is signatory to it. Um, and so that's our starting point. <laughs> Great. And, and let's, we've got to also bring in COVID. Uh, there was, a, I, as you know, I, I, I write for Forbes and there was a, a, a conspiracy article, somebody from MI6 looking at, you know, China and it being in uh, the, the, the COVID virus being bioengineered. Um, I, I'm sorry to spring this on you, Megan. It's not one of the questions that I, that I, that I prepared. I'd looked into this long ago and the consensus is there is no, you know, there is, the, the COVID is not an engineered, uh, an engineered organism. Are you, are you, are you, what are you, what are you seeing in terms of that debate, that conspiracy theory that's been going around? Where are you seeing things uh, kind of land right now? 
Yeah, um, well, I hadn't expected these questions, John, but I think it's an important thing to keep track of here. Is, well, it's coming um, on in my mind, and I'm thinking, well, everybody's asking the obvious at the same when we're talking about bioweapons, so I think I've got yeah, to bring it up. Yeah, so what's important here in a moment where we're realizing that a small piece of, um, of, of RNA right, has bought uh, the nation and the world to its knees in new ways is that we really need to understand more about the ways that biological threats um, emerge and propagate. Right, and so I think one of the things to, uh, in, the, in light of these conspiracy theories and others, is to separate out all the different um, concerns and the things we need to know more about, right? So it, no we may never know all of the details about how um, COVID um, and SARS-CoV-2 emerged. Um, there's a lot of information in the forensics of this um, that doesn't have to do with only the biology alone. Um, but we should know more, uh, and there's uh, plans around doing um, investigations in, into origins, and, and that's important work, um, but it's only all a small part of, of what we're, we're talking about today. Great, excellent. So I do want to just go around and give, and give quick introductions uh, and, and, and kind of set the scene. Can you give us a, a scene setting in terms of what you're seeing in Washington, some of the things that have come up recently um, about the different acts and, and the different things that you're seeing? Sure. Um, well, let me just... Uh, step back for a moment and, and tell you who I am, and then I'll tell you uh, a little bit about Great, uh, please do. the work that we're seeing in Washington. So um, I've been uh, newly elected as the Executive Director of Biopolicy and Leadership Initiatives at Stanford, which is a across um, and beyond the university initiative to engage on issues of how biological science and technology are shaping societies and how do we steer innovations to promote public interests. And so that's how some of these issues come into play. I'm an adjunct faculty in the Department of Bioengineering and then to these issues, I've spent five years working at the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford, which is part of our Institute of International Affairs, to look at topics around how safety and security concerns intersect with broader biotechnology innovation portfolios. Um, and so I've spent a lot of time working with universities and public partners um, to, to understand how we can promote this incredibly powerful field of science and technology and also uh, shepherd and, and safeguard that technology at the same time. So uh, many of us know uh, that biology is powerful and important, um, but we're seeing growing recognition of that and consolidation of, of efforts both in the US government and in governments around the world. And so some signals of this recently have been um, the, uh, in, the, in the fall in the US government, there was a summit um, uh, at the White House on uh, the bioeconomy and leadership in the bioeconomy. Um, there have also been uh, legislative efforts both in the House and uh, in the Senate about the bioeconomy research and development um, uh, bill, which are coordinating efforts um, to allow multiple agencies to help promote um, and protect uh, biotechnology innovation. Um, and now we're seeing biology um, as one of the areas of importance in a number of um, industries and technologies of the future um, being introduced through um, uh, potential uh, legislation like the uh, Endless Frontiers Act. Um, there's also um, in uh, PCAST recommendations that have outlined new national lab coordination efforts around industries of the future. And we're seeing other interagency efforts um, like the um, NSTC, Science Technology Council, which others here can speak to, um, to help develop an agenda um, that is ambitious to both coordinate efforts and, and fund major new initiatives. Um, and so uh, baking in safety and security elements has been a key part of this, as well as broader ethical and social um, issues, including developing a more sustainable and secure um, economy. Great. It looks maybe like John's internet froze for a little bit. This is Kevin here at SynBioBeta just hopping in to say hi. Um, hopefully John will be joining us again really soon. Um, maybe we turn the conversation uh, next to, uh, uh, let's go to uh, Doug Friedman, if, if we could, Doug. Uh, thank you for, for joining us and, and welcome to the show. Happy to. Uh, Doug, you're, uh, you want to tell us a little bit, you're the executive director of the Engineering Biology Research uh, Consortium, and 
Your interests include governance of biotechnology, safeguarding the bioeconomy, and accelerating scientific advancement by building diverse and robust uh, community partnerships. Can you tell a little bit, just maybe just introduce your role generally uh, about what you're, what you're doing there and, and how you're thinking about this space and some of the, the areas uh, that are emerging in the government that are interesting to you? Sure, ha happy to, John. So um, I'm uh, Doug Friedman. I'm the executive director of the Engineering Biology Research Consortium, as, as John mentioned. We're a nonprofit public private partnership, really to, uh, trying to draw connections between academia, industry, and government around uh, opportunities in engineering biology. Um, in doing that, there uh, we've seen a lot of, of uh, interesting developments uh, and important developments that Megan just just outlined, really that have been direct public support, uh, public sector support for uh, for this field. Um, and uh, one of the things that I think is is important to recognize is that while we uh, uh, certainly on this panel. Uh, and likely the vast majority of attendees listening have known for a long time that biology has an incredible opportunity to impact every sector of the economy, all facets of society. That has not always been widely known throughout the US government. There's certainly people, right? We have Justin who was in government, who's <laughs> known this for a long time. Um, and there are there are individuals in government who have known this for a long time, but government wide, this has not always been a part of the a part of the the culture. And it's really been biology is you know a set of of basic research, uh, early science, uh, academic work that is done to develop uh, you know underlying science and knowledge, which then can lead to largely health related applications. Right, but the idea of using biology to impact energy is relatively new in that context, but still old to us, right? And then starting to think about how you do that for a wide range of industrial products uh, is yet newer to uh, uh, newer uh, to them, um, and the opportunities that uh, you know come come across with even newer biotechnology uh, and synthetic biology strategies. Um, are are yet newer to the government still, um, but the real transformation that I've seen over say the last two to three years, sort of slow, exponentially growing, uh, has been a recognition by government that uh, biotechnology can do all the things that we've been saying they can do all along, and there is now intense intense interest in actually getting engaged to do those things, having the U.S. government play a leadership role and an appropriate role in, in some of those areas, whether that's through legislation, whether that's through new, interesting, or innovative programs. Um, but one of the things that I think is important for us uh, all uh, in the synthetic biology community is to have direct engagement with our government, for those of us who are in the US. Right, have that direct engagement, talk to scientists and engineers actively working in government, talk to program managers, uh, understand that ha having that direct engagement is one of the ways you can build out uh, the areas that, that we all, all care about. And I'll, you know, I will call out Jason and Ginkgo, has done an incredibly, uh, incredible job uh, you know, for Ginkgo, but really for synthetic biology writ large, at raising the prominence of the field in uh, within the U.S. government, and doing that is then, um, you know, something that we can all uh, take advantage of uh, and demonstrate how synthetic biology can provide uh, the solutions that John was was alluding to uh, earlier on around a, a sustainable and and better world. Yeah. Welcome back, think, John. Yeah, I think we have yeah. John back. Great. Thank you, Kevin. And Kevin, maybe you can just stay on as co-host in case uh, my sure. internet crashes again. I'm actually just dialing in for my cell phone now. That's the power of Zoom, I guess. Um, Justin uh, Sanchez, you were the head of the Biological Technologies Office at DARPA. 
and, and now you're at Battelle. If you could just give us a, a, a quick intro to what you do at Battelle and then maybe give us some scene setting of what, what, how long you were at DARPA and just quickly briefly what DARPA is for anybody who's, who's not familiar with it and maybe talk a little bit about uh, what, what, you, what you were seeing and about the government's new engagement around biotechnology and the bioeconomy. Yeah. So, uh, John, thanks so much for having me on the panel here today. And it's, uh, it's really great to see so many people uh, attending this virtual session. I wish we were in person, but we're in a, a whole different world. Uh, but what we still are able to connect today, so I'm really happy and, and joyous about that. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm a tech fellow at Battelle Memorial Institute. We're the uh, world's largest science and technology not-for-profit organization. And uh, I, I developed strategy and helped to push all of biotechnology forward, not only inside of Battelle, uh, but in the, both the government and the commercial um, worlds. Um, like John said, I, before joining Battelle, I was the director of the biotech office over at DARPA. And uh, for those of you who don't know DARPA, it's kind of the high-tech uh, research branch of the Department of Defense. And the thing that I really wanted to share here today in the context of the bioeconomy and biotechnology in general and how we should engage as a community back with the government, there's one very important kind of theme or element of what we did at DARPA that made all the difference in the world. We developed new programs that had a very clear focus or capability in mind. And you know, Doug touched on this also a little bit, you know, it wasn't just, it's not just science for the, the sake of science, it's science for a purpose. And in our country, we have a, a purpose where we need to lead in the bioeconomy. We need to deliver capabilities that will enable our, our country to really thrive. And, and I think we're at a time and, you know, um, a lot of people kind of go to go to these kinds of examples like when we said we were going to go to the moon or we said we were going to go and build an interstate system or we said we were going to go out and build an internet or a microelectronics industry. It's these kinds of pushes that catalyze our country, brought the resources together and ultimately helped our, our country to deliver the things that really set us apart. So if there's kind of one thing that you know um, I could share with everybody here today is like we're at this moment, it's how do we rally together to help our government to uh, you know not only see that direction but also move forward in, in that kind of a direction. Um, with that being said, I also think that we have a lot of really great seeds of science and technology that you know are absolutely coming out of uh, you know the DARPA efforts uh, of the past that can help us propel in the future. And again, just to give you a few very quick examples of this. So, you know, we had two very big thrusts in the, the biotech office while I was there. It's like gene editing and synthetic biology was one, and then outpacing infectious disease is another. And again, they're even more relevant today uh, as we're living through a pandemic, but, you know, the programs like Living Foundries, uh, Engineering Living Materials, the BRICS program, Safe Genes, the Pandemic Prevention Platform Technology, all of these programs and the people that were associated with it that helped to establish and drive them forward, they're giving us those capabilities that I think where this group, uh, you know, on the line here today, we can rally behind those kinds of things, help our government to also be empowered and enabled by those things, and then really start to change the future. Back over Fantastic. to you, Doug. Thank you, Justin. Uh, excellent perspective there. Uh, Mike Corris, we had Jim Collins as one of the early guests on these Symbi Beta Lives. Jim was your I think he was your thesis uh, advisor um, at, um, at, uh, at BU when you were there. Um, yeah. So you've got a, a pretty incredible pedigree. You've started companies, you've been at flagship ventures. Um, tell us a little bit about your background and then tell us what you're up to now at Patel. Sure, happy to. So, so you also gave Jim an award, by the way. So not just as a, <laughs> he was on the podcast, he also got one of those awards, I think with George Church, obviously very appropriate. Both keystone members of the of the synthetic biology community um, in the U.S. broadly, and, and originators of the field, so super duper awesome. And uh, it was interesting um, coming out of Jim's lab. I started the company because my focus and my desire was always to actually take something that is super cool on the bench and actually make something out of it that people can give me money for and, and essentially use. So great utility. Um, that's one of the things that I'm that I'm uh, interested in, essentially making sure that synthetic biology as a whole goes from popping up in your Facebook feed or being on the cover of a magazine to being either you know, in an Amazon warehouse or in a shelf on a store, on, on a shelf in a store somewhere so you can actually buy it at scale because you can't really go to Ikea and get furniture made out of novel materials, whatever is mycelium or something else. And you can't go to a, a, a large store and buy something else. And that I think is an aspiration that we need to do better in, as, an, as an industry. So um, I'm working with Battelle right now. My day job, I'm, a, I'm an adjunct professor similar to Megan. Uh, I'm in the bioprocessing center down here in SoCal. 
uh, and essentially teach both CMC and, and various different scale-up um, technologies. And, I, and I've been connected by John to Battelle to inject some entrepreneurial energy and, and intensity into the, into the commercialization efforts that the industry as a whole uh, can benefit from. And I think what's really excited me coming at it from a non-governmental or, or haven't been involved deeply with the governmental side is that the government cares about actually providing some of that initial seed capital, if you will. I think seed capital for the government is like 100 million or less, give or take. So very different from, an, from a startup side. But uh, there are these institutes that the government has funded, the Manufacturing Innovation Institutes. And as a manufacturing guy, that excites me, right? So there's finally one, which I think is, is part of, of Jason's doing, which infinitely appreciated. And, and at some point in time, he's got to tell me the trick of how to get money out of the government at that scale. Um, but essentially, there finally is one for synthetic biology. So that's super exciting. And, uh, and I think there is a huge benefit for the industry as a whole, meaning you got to actually say like, look, everybody in, let's go and work this out together because there's still a struggle that I've experienced. And I think that many others on this call are also experiencing acutely. You're doing a lot of great work on the bench. You're scaling up your, your bug slowly that produces something for you. And eventually as you traverse that slope upwards towards bigger and bigger and bigger scale, it doesn't work anymore so well. So all of a sudden you're missing your targets, you're missing your production targets and you're missing your yield targets and it doesn't work. And I think we can do better as an industry to actually look at this from a holistic perspective, of course, take data into account and all these other things. So that's what gets me up in the morning, uh, really on the manufacturing side, making sure that we as an industry actually deliver on the promise that synthetic biology can really be. That's it. Great, excellent. Jason Kelly, what does this look like from a, from a synthetic biology uni, uni, unicorn CEO's point of view? Yeah, so I, I think we're, we're coming up on a really unique time for the industry. So, so um, I think there's two things going on with COVID-19 uh, in terms of its impact on, on U.S. government policy. One is biology is at the forefront, right? We are, we are all highly aware right now of the power of biology, right? Um, which means that across the U.S. government, everyone is thinking about biology and, you know, whether it's the, the DOD to the NSF, you know, it, it is and to, to, the H, to HHS, it is on people's minds. Um, secondly, the government's spending a lot of money. Right. Um, you know, they're trying to inject stimulus into the country. So 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 checkbooks are open. Um, and so I think this is something our industry sh should be paying attention to coming up. Um, you know, <clears throat> I think the United States, like 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 philo philosophically, what, what we do well when it comes to, to technology development and, and you can in our, you know, sort of the most proximal technology like this, I'd say um, uh, to us today was, was sort of the Internet development is. The U.S. acts in the U.S. interests, but the U.S. interests are to build technology that is open standards that can be used by the world. Um, and that's not always the case um, uh, across you know, countries worldwide. Um, you have uh, places that tend to be more protective uh, and trying to close off technologies. And so I think uh, there's a moment for us here to engage with the U.S. government. Uh, set a similar um, uh, mentality as with the development of the internet that synthetic biology is a programming technology. It's programming cells, like, you know, like we program computers, uh, and that the tools uh, and, and techniques and data, and we should be establishing the, the, uh, the standards that the whole world will use as we uh, develop the platform technologies to program these cells. They aren't really uh, just for the United States. And so I think that's one of the, the things that we should make sure we get right as a community as we engage um, with the government on this. Um, and then secondly, I think we do have some very specific opportunities. You know, um, Mike mentioned that the DOD has been focused on these manufacturing institutes. I think that's a great chance. You know, that, I'll talk about a narrow one and a broad one. You know, that, that's a narrow one, which is really dedicated to our field, right? Um, and so I'm, I'm really excited to be working with Mike and, and Justin on that uh, to try to make sure we we shape something that both creates the opportunity to see products get through to full-scale manufacturing, like Mike talked about, but also speaks to the tool developers, right? Um, um, those of us uh, like Inco and uh, equipment providers and, and folks in the uh, uh, molecular biology tools that are trying to figure out what should we make uh, to best support the developers of these applications that will then scale up and, and go to market. So those two communities, I think um, the DOD uh, rightly is focusing on just in our little corner of the world. So that's really exciting that that sort of those MIIs that are coming, that MII that's coming up. But then more broadly, you know, uh, Megan talked about the, the Endless Frontiers Act at NSF. I think that's also a thing we should be paying attention to. Uh, it's not anything that's passed, but, but to give you, you know, they're talking about a, you know, $100 billion push is a reinvention of the National Science Foundation. Um, and, and if you look at 
what synthetic biology is, we are like a, an area of hard technology. Um, and what I mean by that is we are, there's technical risk embedded in company building in synthetic biology. There is not technical risk involved in developing a company around an app on your iPhone, right? There, there's market risk, like, you know, will grown adults ride scooters, right? That's market risk. But, it, but can you build a scooter sharing company? Of course, you know, right? There's no technical risk. There is a whole sea of companies, not just in synthetic biology, but in space, in, in materials and so on. You know, SpaceX and Tesla are great examples of these, where the beginning of the company has embedded technical risk. And there's not a lot of good ways to get those companies funded today. And so I think there's a big opening for the National Science Foundation to build on programs like the SBIR program, which is really responsible for, you know, a big part of how Ginkgo got going along with um, DARPA and RPE. Uh, you know, the first four years of the company were all early stage government R&D grants. And that's because we were wringing out technical risk. And there wasn't any venture capitalist willing to take technical risk in non-therapeutic synthetic biology in 2008. Honestly, today, there's still barely any. And, and so, and, and that, that holds true across not just biology, but all these other areas. Well, my argument is the government can play this role where they set the technical bar not the commercial bar. They say, we can tell BS technology from not because we do it all the time when we give out government grants and we'll decide which companies have real technology. We'll give them that few million dollars to get the ball rolling over a series of years, ring out that technical risk on the ones that do work. And then they call up Y Combinator. Then they call up the traditional venture community once the technology has been de-risked. The government in the United States, uh, uh, I think has a big opportunity coming up in, in the near term to do that. And we should make sure synthetic biology is one of the areas they're, they're doing a lot of that um, so that it's easier for folks to start uh, companies like Ginkgo uh, in the future. So um, yeah, but I think it's, it's really, it's a very exciting time for synthetic biology when it comes to the interface with, with the United States government, both through things like the MII um, that we're happy to be doing with Patel and then um, uh, through this NSF uh, uh, reinvention. Fantastic. Jason, that's a really, really valuable perspective. And also great to point out the role of government funding. We all pay tax dollars. We all pay them, pay them in. They can be used to lower the risk for industry, which then creates a huge multiple uh, on that return. Mike, uh, we have actually a question from, from Uma Valetti um, on, uh, on scaling up specifically mm. and what does that look like in, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in the MII that you propose. So Mike, can you take yeah. that? And you know, if, if, if Uma's if uh, Uma uh, Valetti's, and I'm sorry I can't bring you on Uma because I'm on my cell phone now and, uh, and I can't bring you on live, but um, uh, if Uma, Uma's the CEO of Memphis Meats, they're looking to scale up cell, cell, cell engineering, cell manufacturing for food, uh, how might an MII help him? Yeah, so I think, I think the critical uh, uh, question that we need to answer here is essentially what are the technology platforms that we need in order to advance manufacturing? It's been fantastic, and, and Ginkgo and, and others on the EBRC side have done fantastic work really advancing the state of the art by actually putting a lot of effort into into building transformational platforms that's the only way anything really scales so i think that is really critically for the mission of the mii to make sure that you can say we are developing platform or platforms to allow you to essentially take eventually an arbitrary molecule an arbitrary host and an arbitrary feedstock put those all together and essentially run them through a platform or a number of platforms and get a reasonable chance of success in a reasonable time because right now you're essentially dealing with this enormously huge parameter universe that you're trying to reduce, reduce, reduce as you're going up the scale up curve because each data point that you're generating at, at 200 kiloliters is a little bit more expensive than at two milliliters, obviously. So we, we have these, these connections between these different scales, but we don't, always, we don't always get them right. So essentially a little bit more on the platform side is really critical for all of us. It's actually, by the way, true. So the funny thing is I had good discussions with, with some folks on the call here. Uh, fermentation is not just liquid, it's also solid. And I think it's really exciting because building materials, generally speaking, solid, right? So getting both of those halves right and really pushing them forward is really critical for the industry as a whole. And then essentially making sure that everybody is capable of, of both making enough that they can sell to the government. Because actually, it's funny to, for me to see this as an entrepreneur. The DoD really wants to buy stuff, but they can't because there isn't enough of it around. So let's just make enough stuff and sell it to them. And then everything flows through to the general public. If you want to make flight suits out of spider silk, because spider silk doesn't drip or fuse to your skin when you're exposed to flame. That's great. It's probably also good for firefighters. So there's a lot of that going around. Great, excellent. Uh, Justin, any any thoughts from your perspective in terms of uh, in terms of scale up and, and specifically what Patel's doing in that area? 
Yeah, um, you know, one of the things that um, I think is just extremely important on, on this front, and again, this kind of gets back to the, um, the the comment about having concerted focus efforts in all of this. Um, you know, from a from a capital perspective, you've got to have enough funds uh, aggregated together to enable the people, let's say whether you want to do scale up or you want to do any other project in the government and beyond in order to kind of make all of that happen. The, the kind of you know, uh, drips and drabs of government funding uh, don't help us to get to a scale that we can affect an economy or it doesn't get us to a scale where we can achieve whatever that moonshot might be uh, moving forward. So again, I, I definitely think that um, it's the combination of the science and the technology, it's the support from government and beyond, and then it's, it's kind of coalescing all of that together to truly deliver a product, given that that product is, is a focus of, of what your effort is. So again, it's very much about the integration uh, to make it happen. Great. Megan, any thoughts on, on, on this discussion on scale-up specifically, and, and maybe more, more generally, how does the government go about assessing its return on investments from some of these policy decisions or some of these stimulus efforts that it's creating? Um, I think that there are a few different facets to this, and I wanted to, to draw on what, um, what Jason was saying earlier, right? The, what does it mean to succeed um, in advancing this technology, right? It, it matters not only that we are accelerating innovation, but it's how we do so and how we think about the, the types of, of effects of leadership in this domain, the, the form of the technology matters, the way that we think about um, the values that are coupled to the technologies that we are, are promoting. And, um, and one of the, the amazing things about um, innovation strategies and policies in the US is, is often thinking beyond immediate returns, right? Thinking about those long-term returns on the, not just the, the health and wealth and security of our nation, but the health and wealth and security of the world. <laughs> um, and so, um, and, it, and a second bit of this that I wanna couple, couple to this is that the ways that we value innovation, the ways we organize innovation is itself in need of innovation, right? What are the metrics that we choose? How do we track those metrics over time? And so um, I think it's important to not be bound by our, our traditional return on investment calculations <laughs> as we can reconsider the types of innovation um, strategies and, and, and models that, that we're interested in, in promoting. And um, just one example of this, now that we're looking at um, uh, you know, biotechnology as being um, critical to saving lives, right, in the immediate um, with, with COVID, it is also clearly becoming apparent that the knock-on effects to our economy and the stability of, um, of nations around the world, our supply chains is, uh, is something that we, we didn't anticipate the, the full consequences. So I think some of the others here can probably speak more directly, like Justin, um, who've led some of these major programs that have different return on investment through DARPA than there is through NSF or through other government efforts. Um, but as a whole, we need to think about, you know, what does it mean? What is the value of, of being able to understand and, uh, and manipulate our the stuff we're made of, right, and our living environments. Um, so it's a little bit of a side <laughs> uh, comment here, but it also relates to the types of work that will need to be supported under these major initiatives, right? It's not just the science and technology, it is also the social science, the economics, the political science, the ethics <laughs> um, that need to uh, be coupled so that they are developing useful metrics and useful missions. Um, for, for each of these technologies. Thank you. Justin, do you want to come back to that? Yeah, um, I mean, the, the value proposition, uh, you know, I, I think it's just fascinating right now, again, given that we're living through COVID and the pandemic. And you know, I would say prior to this experience, uh, you know, a lot of people in positions that were making decisions about things might have thought about biology as biotechnology as kind of you know, the thing they did in 10th grade, you know, class, right, Di dissecting the frog. And like, I, I've given presentations on, on that. Um, and, and it's a very different world. I think now that we've all been kind of personally affected by it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an awakening, right, where we can say, 
there are technologies that are emerging that will affect our, our health, our well-being, our prosperity as a country moving forward. And again, that value proposition can be immediate in the case of like, you know, a, a new uh, therapeutic for, for COVID or it could even be the supply chain. You know, just think about the reagents that, that we needed uh, for, for COVID. They weren't accessible any other way. Maybe there's some way that bioindustrial manufacturing could have changed uh, something like that. But again, there's the immediate things. And then also like Megan uh, was talking about, beyond those immediate effects, there are going to be follow-on industries that benefit from bioindustrial you know, manufacturing of biotechnology in general. So again, when we say like bioeconomy in this forum, when I think about it, I think of all of those offshoot new businesses, those new markets, those new ways that people will live their lives with biotechnology products. And it's the part that also gets me so excited and out of bed every day in the morning is like this group on the, uh, on the call here today, we are at the forefront of that and we can bring it to reality. And it, I think it's, it's a call to come together to, to make sure that that happens. Great, there's a comment in the chat from, from Drew Endy who says, uh, Jason Kelly, totally agree with what you're saying, but practically right now, it seems like the US government only wants to spend big money on buying off the shelf technologies. How do we move the needle on foundational technology development? Do you wanna answer that, Jason? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, that's hard. You know, the, 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 the like big moves like that, and, and Justin should speak to this too, obviously, you know, uh, DARPA has one, been one of the places where this has lived historically in the U.S. government. Um, but I think they've tended to orient around some sort of like big program, um, uh, whether that's, you know, big computer systems being built in the mid 50s for the first time around missile defense, or whether that was ARPANET, or whether that was the moonshot, pro you know, right? Like, like the, the, the if, if we could create um, uh, a, a flag like that in bio, I think that feeds foundational. Um, I think that's right. I think that's true. Beyond that, uh, yeah, it, it's tough. I mean, I, I mean, other than through the traditional process of our, our sort of research universities, but, um, but getting those big programs where the government is directly feeding into foundational tech at a large scale, I, I tend to think requires some sort of, um, you know, big goal. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm sort of optimistic that that's coming for us because, because the government is going to need to stimulate uh, activities in the United States. And so like, you know, think of it like infrastructure, right? You know, the, the, the infrastructure week we've been joking about for years here in the United States. The, the, uh, like that, that week may be coming for us and we should try to make sure uh, biotech and you know uh, Uma asked that question about biomanufacturing yeah that the US government is there to say hey it would be great to build out a big bu bunch of manufacturing capacity to make sure that we, we keep this sort of thing in the US that could happen I think that's something that could fall out of um, something like the MII um, I also think though to Drew's point it's not just the hardware it's not just the tanks it's also the biology and and the US government could help say let's say we want to have a mammalian cell platform that produces uh, mammalian cell culture at ultra low cost well that's that's for food purposes um would be half tanks and half working on the cells right you know to make them easier and cheaper to grow right and that could become a platform manufacturing technology across the industry that, that companies like umas would, would benefit from at memphis yeah absolutely that's the kind of thing that you could see coming out of these manufacturing institutes but uh, I, I see that as good investments by the U.S. government if it spurs a lot of future uh, industry in the U.S. in those areas, and there'll be a mix of biology and, and physical infrastructure. Doug, can you address uh, Drew's comment about the, 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 you know, the, the technology development, and particularly maybe talk about the road mapping activities that, that you've done at EBRC, and then also talk about the restructuring of the NSF. You know, there's a lot of uh, talking about restructuring the government and particularly the NSF and the NS Frontiers Act um, to bring in more translational uh, technologies. Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll start with some of the efforts that we've had ongoing on the road mapping side, and then I'll turn to the to the NSF part of the of the question, which are uh, somewhat interrelated. Um, so uh, EBRC, one of our core activities is is working with the, the synthetic biology research community to develop long term research roadmaps to uh, for the field. And so it's this idea of how do you get from uh, underlying tools and technologies, some of the things Jason was was referring to, to uh, new companies, to existing companies, to products, to the kilogram plus of material you might need in a manufacturing context. 
Um, and so uh, last year we published uh, a 20 year roadmap for the field. This year we're working on uh, two deep dives, uh, one focused on microbiome research, uh, the inter how can synthetic biology tools really be leveraged to uh, increase what's going on in, a sp in microbiome research, which has been an area of interest for a long time. Uh, also on the materials side. So uh, there, there is a deep uh, material science community. Uh, part of my own personal scientific background comes from working with them quite closely. How do we draw closer relationships with, between the synthetic biology uh, R&D efforts that are underway and the material science community that exists to push biology further into the materials lens? So if I go to a, a you know, hardcore material scientist somewhere, um, they're not often thinking about how biology or synthetic biology can help make their material better, right? What is the advantage that can bring? Well, when you talk to you know, people from the synthetic biology side, well, here's the list, right? And it's a giant list and that buds, you know, new, new opportunities. Getting to, to John's second uh, part of the question about the National Science Foundation and the, the Endless Frontiers Act. Um, so just a one half step back to set the stage, the Endless Frontiers Act uh, would rename, uh, which has been introduced in the Senate and that's about it. Um, would rename the National Science Foundation to be the National Science and Technology Foundation. It would create a technology arm of NSF that would focus on 10 technology areas. Uh, one of those 10 areas in the, in the bill that has been introduced is um, biotechnology, essentially. I think it's called synthetic biology, gene editing, and something else. Um, as uh, to kickstart this, uh, and, and what this would do is it would really give NSF sort of a renewed technology development focus. Um, there's a lot that can be, can, can be discussed, but one of the things that I think is interesting about uh, this model is, gets a little bit to, to Drew's question. How can you take some of the, uh, what I would call for this community, the more interesting technology developments that are available and translate them into improvements in technologies that can then be deployed writ large. And you know, thinking to this broader topic that we've discussed, you know, the government funds things in, multi, uh, in different buckets, right? And sometimes we think about, basic, there's a basic research bucket, there's applied research buckets, there's technology development, there's just straight buying stuff, right? The government needs to procure a lot of material. And if you don't fit in one of those buckets, if you're not thinking about those buckets, it can be hard to, to have the type of impact that you want. And so this is one of the reasons why I think the Manufacturing uh, Innovation Institute for, for uh, bioindustrial uh, and synthetic biology really has an opportunity to be, to be impactful because if it cuts across all of those areas and really draws a map from how can these innovations, right, they're innovation institutes, how can uh, these innovations really build new opportunity? You can show what's there, de-risk some technologies so that that private sector in base investment uh, is available to directly to Jason's point early on, right? The private sector is not, uh, the VC community is not, still not all that interested in taking a lot of technical risk, right? If, if, if an innovation institute can de-risk it enough, right, cross that line, then you can see a new flood of potential private sector investment into the field. And I would, would, would say that this field, synthetic biology, is uh, in terms of technical risk, slightly above the line right now. It's not gonna take all that much um, in the whole scheme of, of the economy to push it down below that line where you can then see that real flood. And now we're talking about people riding, you know, the market risk of will adults ride scooters, right? And now it's a market risk question, which puts it into the bucket of everything else. And that I think has a real opportunity for the, for the field, both on the government side and on the private sector side to think about, about what can happen here. And then I just wanna end with, with going back to a, uh, one of John's questions, I think it was to Megan, um, about the, the uh, you know, not just about money, really. What, what, what else do we have to be thinking about, right? 
biology is different than other technology areas, right? We are made of it. This, you know, this is a group knows that. And so I think it is incumbent on us to make sure that we are actively considering what the implications of every step along the way are because you know, for, for multiple reasons. And it doesn't matter what angle you, you come at. I tend to come at it. I think it's the right thing to do. It's the ethical thing to do. This is what we should be doing and how we have to do it. Um, but even if you don't, right, even if you want to take a strict, you know, I want the most successful company in the world approach, right? What's going to happen is if we don't do those things along the way, then the government, which is its responsibility, is going to respond to these developments. And if we are not engaging actively, then the regulatory climate becomes very complicated, right? Whereas we have now an opportunity to engage in the regulatory climate, do the things that we need to do to bring society along with us to use these technologies in a way that can be broadly, broadly impactful. So I think all those things really tie it, tie it together. So back to you, Fantastic John. point, Doug. Yeah, I really appreciate that perspective. Uh, and I want to bring Megan in in just a second to talk about the ethical, legal, and social implications of everything that we're doing and also the workforce development piece. But before I do, Mike, Chorus, have you got any kind of response to that in terms of the market risk and technology risk that Doug was saying? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's one thing. But basically, I want to echo what Doug said. So we don't want to get, get caught in the same way that the late 80s and, and early 90s were essentially caught up with, uh, with GMOs and, and the communication around it. And I think that was broadly mishandled all around. And we're now dealing with that. decades later, we're still dealing with that, right? So it's very difficult to move public opinion once it's been established. I think that's stating the, the very obvious. So here, outreach Proactivity is really key, I think, on anything that we do on synthetic biology because it is such a foundational platform technology. I think we're all in this together, and, and of course, everybody on, on the call here probably self-selected in here. There was a question on in the chat box, really. I wanted to address it quickly, like what is an MII, actually? So an MII, I think, is the realization by the government that <clears throat> they can't be doing everything programmatically. They can't be standing up new agencies all the time. <clears throat> so an MII, in my mind at least, is the just repeat what MII stands for, for those of folks. The Manufacturing Innovation Institute, so all things manufacturing, essentially. And there's plenty of ones around. There's, there's 15 or 16, you can 15. You can look it up on manufacturingusa.com uh, for robotics, for photonics, and all these other critical technologies, which, which the U.S. government really cares about advancing, but also essentially says, like, look, we'll, we'll give this money to an organization that, that, is, that is forming itself, that'll be new and independent, and that organization will then put together a consortium. I think that's what's really critical to understand for everybody on the, on the call here, the consortium is what drives the success. Near, I can tell like from what I've seen at, at these other MIIs, the consortium itself drives the success and it must have, it must be inclusive. It must have academic members, obviously, uh, nonprofit organizations. The industrial base must be represented and the industrial base are, are people that essentially have either molecules that they want to scale up, that provide capacity or capabilities, right? CNC, including instruments, high throughput instruments or capacity, fermentation capacity that may be necessary they provide platform access or, or they provide just skill, right? So one of the things that we also wanna make sure everybody gets it that the, the manufacturing institutes are supposed to increase the skill base, right? It's not just about technology, it's also skill base because best technology in the world doesn't drive itself really. It's not human out of the loop, it's on the loop from a machine learning perspective at least. Um, so the market risk then, uh, the, the government wants to, wants to essentially lower a little bit for, for private sector investment, which is fair, but actually what I've seen from the consortia that that have formed themselves, industry is very happy to engage with, with the government and, and this new MII construct that they always have um, to essentially drive this technology development forward. So you're starting to build in your buyers, right? This is very critical. If you wanted to start a new company, for example, you have a buyer universe that you're talking to at the time while you're developing your technology roadmap. And I don't think of it so much as scale up, it's more scale through, right? You're scaling through to the market because you're not done when you've done a little bit of scale up, there's so much more still to do, but again, scope of the MII is always somewhat limited. So here in this case for the synthetic biology, the next challenge that we have, accepting that platform technology has, has advanced quite a bit, which is really nice. Now we need to scale through a little bit like to the next big hurdle. So if you want one, two, and three, so we're in the stage two right now for synthetic biology to become a real pillar of the economy, if you want to call it industrial revolution 4.0 or 5.0, I've lost count, but that's, that's sort of where, where I see it. And so what does it look like, what you're building, your MII with Battelle, and how would people participate? It's not my MII, right? So it, it's the industry's MII, if you will. 
and and this is one of those things where where the government still needs to make final determinations, right? This is not this is not a this is not a done deal in any way, shape, or form. But I think it's critical to think of any MII as a really collaborative network, and that that is really what I want to want to think about when we're saying we want to have everybody around the table, all the academia, all of the industry from all of the various angles, because only then can you say like we're actually looking at the market appropriately. We're looking at all the angles that are around the issues. That's that's what I think is necessary. If you want to talk to me about scale up all day long. That's that's what I really care. Great, excellent. Megan, so talking about the uh, the, the uh, ethical and social implications and maybe talking about the workforce development, you're a proponent for the bioeconomy for all. Um, you know, you're, 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 you're working a lot in, in, in that regard. What are you seeing in terms of the government trying to fund uh, ethical, social and, and workforce development issues around the bioeconomy? Uh, thanks for this question, John. Um, one of the things I have really appreciated about this whole community and all the people on this call and who are, are calling in today um, is that synthetic biology as a field has never just been about uh, technology or the industry. It's really been also about the people and the culture and the environment that we're part of. And that's really been baked in at the forefront. Um, and, and that has happened in part through um, government efforts to resource, fund, and structure um, those engagements. So uh, in things like the early um, Sinberg through the NSF investments, which did a, a, um, an unusual recombination of having a uh, social behavioral element um, through the human practices work directly coupled into one of the thrusts of a major multi-university field building effort. We also saw that coming through iGEM, um, and, and many of the other uh, types of, of government-led and, and now um, in industrial-led efforts um, of baking in these principles. And so the question is, now that we're seeing these even larger investments maturing, um, not just in the US and elsewhere, how do we continue to mature and structure the work um, in these areas? And so um, what I see as an opportunity uh, to to do a few different things. So one is, um, it's not just implications, it's not downstream, it's actually about what's the mission and goal of the entire enterprise. Um, so how do you begin to have that integration in strategy and operations? And that's like, who's on the governing board, right? And and also what types of project do you fund? Are they just technology products? Or are, they, or are they public policy and operations projects? Um, it's about supporting different types of work, applied research and basic research in areas like economics, in um, political science, in humanities. Um, uh, and it's also about feeding that all the way through the education and workforce development. Um, and thinking about, and it's not just the workforce, it's whose lives will be shaped by synthetic biology, by bioengineering, um, everyone. And everyone's lives are already shaped <laughs> by bioengineering everyone. And so really it's about actually equipping everyone to be able to make wise choices about the ways that they are already and might in the future engage with these technologies. And so um, I, I think that it's all of those things. And if we recognize that LC isn't just an advisory capacity, <laughs> but rather it's part and parcel of every element of a, an innovation strategy, of a public policy um, strategy, um, then we're, we're going to be able to move forward. And so it takes interdisciplinary work, integration, differentiation, adaptive approaches to regulation, I mean, at the end of the day, people who are willing to champion that cause. Fantastic. Uh, Justin Sanchez, last word, what does success look like to you? Um, well, this is going to be interesting. I say we change the world. We change our, our future. Uh, we change our stars together. I, um, I, I'm very uh, um, energized by what we can do uh, as a team here. So looking forward to actually bringing it to reality. Awesome. Thank you all so much. I'm sorry that we're out of time, but I hope you, uh, I wish you well on, the, on your next Zoom call in two minutes. Um, and uh, I look forward to seeing everybody uh, either in another Symbiobeta Live or at a, at a physical event at some point in the future. So if you're not signed up to our newsletter, go to symbiobeta.com and sign up. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all again soon. So thanks again, all of my panelists, uh, Justin Sanchez, Jason Kelly, Megan Palmer, uh, Doug from Sinberg, and uh, Mike Chorus. Thanks again, everybody. See you soon. Bye-bye now.